Um, okay, so I'm going to present uh, part of the work I've been doing so far, talking about the detection capabilities of underwater dust. The picture that you see here on the top is a typical image of how earthquakes are recorded on dust. What we have here on the vertical axis is distance along the fiber. This is two kilometer section of fiber located offshore uh, Metony in Greece. And this is a function of time. So basically every row in this picture is one seismogram, strain rate seismogram, recorded at a specific location along the fiber. We see that the earthquake wave front arrives at uh, second six or seven. Then we see a very complicated propagation pattern that we see in the rest of the image. And during this talk, I'm going to um, present most of the noise sources and how earthquakes are recorded using dust and explain a lot of things that we can see here in this image. So the outline of the talk, first of all, I'm going to say a few words about dust technology, how it works, then the goals of this study, uh, present the analysis of uh, noise. We had three different cables in the Mediterranean. I'm going to show results for all three. Then examples of uh, earthquakes, how the cable responds to earthquakes, how the fiber optic records earthquakes. Uh, then in order to compare dust to standard seismometers, which is the most common way to obtain uh, seismic observations, we need to convert the measurements. So dust records strain rate or strain, while seismometers record ground acceleration or velocity. The transition between the two is not so straightforward. So I'm going to talk about that a few, few minutes. And finally, implications for underwater dust detection and summarize. So how does dust work? Um, the main concept, this technology is illustrated using this uh, figure. Basically, we take uh, an optical fiber. It can be a telecommunication fiber that's laid down for completely different purposes as we do, as we use here. It can be basically any type of fiber. And on one end of the fiber, we connect our interrogator, as you see here in this box. This is a, an image from Slade and Etat, the paper that came out last year. They used a fiber that's deployed offshore too long. You can see here, this is the shore. The interrogator was placed on this end of the fiber. And using this interrogator, we can actually obtain seismic measurements from different locations along the fiber, going to 40 something kilometers from the shoreline, depths up to two and a half kilometers. So the main, um, the main way that this technology works is the interrogator sends laser pulses through the fiber. <clears throat> and due to small heterogeneities and defects along the fiber, some of the light is backscattered to the interrogator. Now, when a seismic wave from sweeps across the array, it causes the fiber to compress, um, causes it to compress and extend along its axis. And that actually changes the, the fiber, the changes, sorry. <laughs> it changes the, all the discontinuities in the fiber and it changes the backscattered image, the light that goes back to the interrogator. By resolving these phase changes, on the backscattered light, we can actually resolve ground deformations along the fiber. So basically this technology allows us to transform regular optical fibers into long arrays, seismoacoustic sensors, basically obtain strain rate measurements every few meters along tens of kilometers long fibers. So why are we interested in harnessing this technology for underwater seismic monitoring? I think this is uh, most beautifully illustrated using this image. We have a map of the Mediterranean. The black triangles indicate the locations of seismometers. We see that they are mainly located on land. And we see that even in sections, in uh, regions where the seismic networks are very dense, such as here in Italy, there are hardly any stations offshore. And this is a major gap. We have a lot of observations on land, but we almost have no observations underwater. And a lot of uh, big earthquakes, most of the large subduction earthquakes, tsunami generating earthquakes occur underwater. So having the ability to obtain seismic observations from the ocean bottom will have a, many positive, a lot of positive influence on our ability to conduct seismological research. Um, in red, we see the current layout of telecommunication cables in the Mediterranean. We see that they cover almost the entire um, sea floor. And if we will be able to harness these cables for seismic monitoring, we will effectively fill in this very large observational gap. And this will have a lot of uh, consequences. For example, earthquake early warning, 
if we will be able to obtain measurements very close to the origins of underwater earthquakes, it will significantly improve warning times. We don't have to wait for seismic waves to arrive at on-land stations. We can obtain the observations very close to the source. It can also help us study tsunami generating earthquakes by uh, placing fibers close to uh, subduction trenches. And it will also enable us to image underwater, underground underwater structures using this technology. And these are only examples. There are many beautiful things that can be done with this technique. But first of all, to reliably use it for seismic monitoring, we need to understand a few things. So the goal, the main goal of this study is to understand the potential of dust for underwater seismic monitoring. And we asked ourselves, uh, we asked ourselves a few questions. How are earthquakes recorded on underwater dust? What is the response of the cable? The quality of seismic uh, measurements? What are the effects of noise? We have a lot of noise sources here. I'm going to present most of them. Uh, the effects of the cable layout. Now, because these cables were not meant for seismological purposes, they are simply deployed to provide communication between two points in space. In our case, um, these are cables used for scientific experiments. So they go from the shore to the ocean bottom only to provide communication. We don't know 100% their geographical location and we don't know their coupling. And some cable segments may even be hanging in the middle of the water column. So this is another issue that uh, creates a few problems when you want to do seismic monitoring. And the measurement type, as I said, does measure strain or strain rate, while seismometers and most of our models rely on ground motions. So we need to convert one to the other in order to do um, the comparison. And finally, how are the detection capabilities compared to uh, standard seismometers, which are the common approach to obtain seismic uh, observations? Um, we can proudly say that uh, GeoAzul has the largest data set of underwater uh, dust records. Here we used three different cables, one in Toulon, as you can see in the left inset, and two cables that are deployed offshore Metony in southwest Greece. So we see all the cables starts from a point on shore and make their way to the ocean bottom. When we look at the bathymetrical profiles of these cables, as you can see here, we see that they have different lengths. These are the two cables in Greece. One goes up to a depth of four kilometers, which is very deep for the Mediterranean, and is about 26 kilometers long. Another one is um, 11, sorry, 13 kilometers long and goes to a depth of one and a half kilometer. The longest cable we had was in Toulon, going from the shore to a depth of two and a half kilometers over about 44 kilometers, the length of the cable. We can see that the bathymetry is very complex the, and the cable goes up and down and up and down going all the way to the ocean bottom. And this is only the bathymetry. We don't know if the cable is actually touching the ground in all these places along the path. Most likely it is not. And uh, this will be shown later on. So a lot of noise sources to take into account. Are you seeing this? I mean, is it, is it bothering? You can see it. Okay, so move it here. So to properly quantify all the noise that we have on these instruments, we calculated power spectral densities for the full experiments of the cable. So the two top the two top panels are for the two cables in Greece, and the bottom one is for the cable in Toulon. So for the top one we had about five days, for the middle one we had only one day. And the bottom, the Toulon, it's not the experiment used for the paper last year. It's another one done after that. We have 20 days of data. And what we see here, the red line, is the bathymetry. We see the axis for the red line on the right and the axis for log of frequency on the left. And you can see that the horizontal axes are different for the cables because they have different lengths. So the first thing that we see is the effect of the coupling. The most striking feature here are these vertical strips that we see that are most, uh, most well observed here on the middle panel. And these are associated with a coupling. Uh, variations on the order of meters to tens of meters where the cable may be well coupled to the ground or not as well coupled, maybe even hanging in the water column. We also see that when we look at this high energy region, which is the secondary microsystems, you see that there are some sections like here 
where we don't record the secondary microseismics. So it is probable that here the cable is not properly touching the ground. We have the instrumental noise. Here we use two different interrogators. The same one was used for the two campaigns in Greece, and the different one was used for the campaign in Toulon. We see that they have different noise levels. The one used in Greece was a prototype, a much more primitive um, interrogator. We see it by the color code, the color difference. For Toulon, the colors are uh, more dark, darker blues, as you can see here on the scale. While for Greece, the colors are, li are lighter. And this is mainly a function of the quality of the laser. Now, with technological advances, and even now the interrogators, the new ones that are going on market, have much lower noise levels. And this is something that will be less and less relevant with time. We have these hanging sections, these high energy regions, where the cable is actually hanging over a large portion of it, over a seafloor valley. This is an image from the study that uh, Daniel Mata is currently doing. You can actually see the first mode of the cable vibration. And this is obviously a section where earthquakes cannot be reliably recorded, but we can use these sections of cable for other purposes. For example, using this pattern, we can, the, the proper, sorry, the resonance of this cable, we can resolve the speed of underwater ocean currents. So there is a silver lining even to some of the noise sources. Secondary micro seismics. Here we see them only for too long to this high energy region, going all the way to the ocean bottom. And we see that the frequency of these secondary micro seismics is a function of the depth. When we go deeper from 21 kilometers to 35, as you can see here in the cross sections, going from the orange curve to the green one, the frequency of these secondary micro seismics <coughs> decreases. Uh, there's another cross section here, very close to shore, water depth of 10 meters. It's two kilometers from the interrogator, which is actually about 300 meters from the shore. We see a very high energy region. It corresponds to waves approaching the coast and breaking. And we have this peak, which is gravity waves. So the gravity waves can be seen for all three cables. Now we zoomed in on these plots, only up to water depth of 120 meters. We can very well see this high energy region for all three cables. Again, it is a function, the frequency of the gravity waves is a function of the water depth. When we go deeper, for example, from the green curve at 10 meters to the red curve at 20 meters depth, the frequency decreases. And we also see the effect of the coupling. If we look, for example, here in the middle panel, we see variations of the intensity we see a section here that does not record the gravity waves, and this is um, as a this is influenced influenced by the coupling, whether the cable is touching or not touching the ground. Another interesting phenomenon that we see here: in the beginning, these two cables are deployed in Metony Bay, so they start here on the shore. They make their way through Metony Bay, Metony Strait, and head west towards the East Ionian Sea. When they are deployed inside Metony Bay, we have this additional noise peak at one to two hertz. We see it on both cables. They both um, have about the same layout within the basin. We also see it in the section here. We have another noise peak at one to two hertz. And later on, I'm going to show you how this noise peak and how the response of the basin uh, significantly amplifies ground motions. So a lot of noise sources, we can divide them into technical and natural sources. With technical, we have the coupling, the cable is touching or not touching the ground. Instrumental noise, which is something that will improve and become less relevant with time. We have hanging sections of fiber. And we have the issue of the cable location. We are not exactly sure where the cable is. And we don't know uh, if it's touching or not touching the ground. <clears throat> Again, related to the coupling. For natural noise sources, we have the secondary micro seismics that we saw, gravity waves, and basin resonance. So let's see how all these factors influence our ability to record earthquakes. This is an example of one earthquake, magnitude 3.7, recorded at 125 kilometers from the interrogator. Uh, all these panels 
the vertical axis is distance from the interrogator. So the top of the figure is the shore, the interrogator itself. Going down in the figure is going deeper into the ocean. The left panel is the water depth. Next, we have the time series. We have strain rate as a function of time. And we see sections that record seismic waves very strongly, sections that do not record them almost at all. Here we have the spectra, basically FFT for each seismogram on the left, plotted here. The red dotted curve is the slope of the bathymetry. We see the axis here on the top. And on the right, we see signal to noise. So this signal to noise was calculated in the frequency domain between one and 15 Hertz, which is about the same frequency range that you see here uh, in high amplitudes. So let's zoom into a few sections. We can see here that there are sections that record the earthquake quite well and the spectra is pretty much uniform. And there are sections where we have a lot of jumps, both in amplitude and in frequency content. When we look at the slope, we see that sections that, that display a pretty flat slope correspond to sections where the earthquake is recorded quite well. And we have other sections where the slope is very steep or irregular, keeps changing, and the ability to record earthquakes is very uh, significantly damaged. When we look at the shallow part of the cable, we see again sections that record the earthquake well, sections that hardly record any signal. We see a very close link to the bathymetry. Where the bathymetry is flat, the signal is recorded very well. Where the bathymetry is irregular, we see that almost no seismic waves are recorded. And this high energy region that we see here is exactly the cable segment inside Metony Bay. So we can see the response of the bay, the amplification of seismic phases. When we look at the signal to noise, we see a pattern of slight increase, sorry, smooth increase when we go into the basin, and then a smooth decrease when we go out. And this is to be expected if we think of a sedimentary basin. The thick thickness of the sedimentary layer controls how much amplification we, we will have. At the edges of the basin, the sedimentary layers are very thin, so we would not expect much amplification. When we go deeper into the basin, to the middle of the basin, sedimentary layers are thick, and we would expect very significant amplification. Um, now I want to show you a movie <coughs> of this section. We see that the seismic waves arrive at the bay, and then we see wave starts to form at the edges of the basin, make their way towards the center, and then we have this very complex propagation of waves within the basin. So let's play short movie. I'm going to do it slow because I don't know if the connection is good for everybody. What we see here at the top panel is the strain rate as a function of distance <coughs> along the fiber. Basically, it's the strain rate along this red line. We will go forward in time. And you can see that about now, in a few seconds, waves will start to form in the edges of the basin, make their way towards the center. You can see them propagating from right to left towards the, end, towards the center. And then we have this very complicated resonance within the basin. So we saw that the ability to record earthquakes along the cable is very non-uniform. We have a lot of amplitude and frequency modulations, and we have amplifications, and we have sections that do not record almost any seismic signals. We saw that the irregular bathymetry um, has a very close link with low detection capabilities. And when the bathymetry is very um, flat, we are able to record seismic signals quite well. These flat sections usually correspond to sedimentary basins, as we saw here in the flat sections, in the shallow part, sorry. We saw the amplification of the basin, and we saw that this pattern of signal-to-noise, a smooth increase when going into the basin, and a decrease when going out of the basin, helps us identify, um, identify the basin, even without seeing the full image. So in the next sections, going to focus only on cable segments that show relatively uniform uh, seismic records, mainly these sections here marked with orange rectangles. 
because in the next sections we are going to do a Fourier transform on these sections, a Fourier, uh, spatial Fourier transform, and we need cable segments that are long enough to do so. Now, if you want to compare thus strain rate measurements to those obtained by seismometers, acceleration or velocity, the main approach, the common approach to do that is using this equation. <coughs> the strain rate equals ground acceleration divided by the, phase appar the apparent phase velocity. So the apparent phase velocity is obtained using these figures, FK plots. What we see here is a 2D Fourier transform of cable segments such as these here. We see here temporal frequency as a function of spatial frequency, which corresponds to the wave number. This is an example for two earthquakes recorded by the Toulon cable. One was north of the cable, the other was south of the cable. Um, we have here two lines, we see here in white, for different apparent velocities of 250 meters and 500 meters. The slope of this line represents the velocity. When we go for the straight vertical line, the apparent velocity increases. When the slope is less steep, it corresponds with low apparent velocities. We see that these two plots are very similar for the different events. Basically, this plot can help us determine the direction of propagation of these waves. If, wave was, if waves would only propagate towards the interrogator, only positive wave numbers will be activated, and the left half of this plot will have no energy at all. And the other way around, if waves would only propagate towards the ocean bottom, only negative wave numbers will be activated. But the fact that we have this image so symmetric and, sim and similar for two different earthquakes at two different locations back azimuth from the fiber, it tells us that we are seeing scattered waves. And the low velocity that we see here indicates that these are shorter waves. Now, shorter waves are scattered waves, surface waves, very similar to Rayleigh waves that we see uh, on land um, instruments. These are confined to a thin layer between the ocean body, the water body, <coughs> and the solid earth. Because these images are very similar for two earthquakes per cable segment, we obtained the apparent velocity per cable segment. Here we see the two examples from Toulon. And here on the right, we see four different earthquakes recorded by the same cable segment in Greece. So we also see that they're very symmetric and similar between the different events. The difference in intensity here are mostly related with the magnitude and distance of the event. So now for each cable segment, we have one value for an apparent velocity. And we can use this apparent velocity to convert thus strain rate into accelerations or accelerations to strain rate. Now I'm going to show examples of two earthquakes recorded on one of the cables in Greece. We have the map here. So the cable is marked here by this red curve. The two earthquakes that I'm showing are these two red dots. And we have three broadband sensors. Two are located on land close to the interrogator and one ocean bottom sensor located actually at the end of the second cable. So going to these curves, in black, we see dust spectra, basically the Fourier of the strain rate. In red, we see the noise, which we calculated before in the PSDs. And the other three curves in green, red, and orange are broadband accelerations converted to strain rate. And we can actually see a very good agreement between the spectra of dust and broadband uh, when we use the apparent velocity obtained in the FK analysis. This is one cable segment, half a kilometer, at uh, about 20 kilometers from the interrogator. When we look at a different cable segment, and this is actually the segment inside Metony Bay, we see that low frequencies are significantly amplified, while higher frequencies are attenuated. And this is to be expected from the propagation of waves inside a sedimentary basin. We expect attenuation of high frequencies and amplification of uh, low frequencies. Now, to better understand this behavior, we plotted the spectral ratios of earthquakes inside the Metony Bay, the same earthquake recorded inside Metony Bay and outside. So basically what we see here 
is these black curves on the right divided by the black curves on the left. We see very significant amplification between one and two hertz. And when we look back at the PSDs and the noise without looking at any earthquakes, we already saw this peak before corresponding to the resonance within the basin. So the amplification is up to a factor of 10 for just one of the earthquakes. And we also see high frequency attenuation. So this high frequency attenuation can be modeled by imposing additional attenuation on these curves that we see here. So we see the solid curves represent the broadband converted to train rate. And when we impose additional attenuation, we see the, the dashed curves, which show very good agreement with DAS for the higher frequencies. So from these figures, we can conclude that DAS and strain rate agree very well with each other when DAS is corrected for station, uh, station effects, local side effects. So let's talk about the implications for DAS detection. We can convert um, acceleration to strain rate. We can also go the other way, strain rate to acceleration. So here we plotted the PSDs of the broadband stations that we had. We see them here in dotted lines. And the PSDs of DAS converted from strain rate to acceleration using the apparent velocity that we obtain in the FK analysis. We also see here theoretical curves for earthquakes at the distance of 100 kilometers, magnitudes 1, 2, and 3. The most interesting thing to see here to compare is this brown curve, which is the PSD for Toulon, giving the apparent velocity for that cable segment, and the PSD for the ocean bottom sensor near Toulon, near the end of the Toulon cable, which is in green. So the brown solid curve and the green dotted curve. We see that they have very similar noise levels. And this tells us that the detection abilities and signal to noise would be similar for these two instruments. Uh, this is of course true for that apparent velocity uh, that we find for these waves. Now when we look at the signal to noise, the actual signal to noise observed for the earthquakes we analyzed on DAS, the vertical axis, as a function of signal to noise on the broadband, on the horizontal axis, we see that the numbers are very similar, meaning the signal to noise on DAS is very similar to signal to noise on broadband. Um, this is again a function of the phase velocity. We see that we have two instruments here, two different interrogators. The more advanced interrogator corresponds to these black markers here, and we can already see that when we use a better interrogator, one that has lower noise levels, the signal to noise for DAS are almost always higher than for broadband. And with technological advances, these noise levels would decrease and we expect that the signal to noise for DAS would be better than those of broadband. But this is, again, sorry to not be able to stress it enough, it's a function of the apparent velocity. So to understand this behavior, um, we can go back to look at this equation and we can see that for a given acceleration amplitude, if, we, if it is characterized by low velocity, meaning slow waves, they would have high strain rate amplitudes. And if the same acceleration amplitude have high velocities, they would have low strain rate amplitudes. We can look at this figure, again, theoretical figure with earthquake, uh, an earthquake model at 50 kilometers, different magnitudes that we see here on the horizontal axis, and we plotted signal to noise on the vertical axis. Here we use the noise level from the more advanced interrogator and different apparent velocities. So we can see that there is an apparent velocity in which DAS is equivalent to the ocean bottom sensor, in this case, the ocean bottom sensor offshore Toulon. And we see that every phase that has lower velocity will have higher signal to noise and every phase that has higher velocity will have lower signal to noise. So basically if we look at one earthquake, let's say a magnitude 2.1 at 50 kilometers, the body waves characterized by high velocity, let's say three kilometers per second, would get a signal to noise of about one. They would be very hard to detect 
while scattered waves, uh, short waves of the later phases that are characterized by lower velocities, will have higher signal to noise amplitudes, in this case, about five. So the main conclusion from this is it would be much easier for us to detect later arriving phases and scattered waves than it is to detect um, direct arrivals body waves. So to summarize, we saw that there are many both technical and natural noise sources that influence um, the image that we see for dust records and we need to take them into account when we want to analyze earthquakes. We saw how earthquake signals are distorted and we saw that there, this distortion is linked with the bathymetry, with the slope of the cable. We saw that the signals are dominated by slow scattered short waves. We saw that we can easily convert strain rate to acceleration back and forth using the apparent velocity that we can obtain uh, with an FK analysis. We saw similar detection capabilities for underwater dust and seismometers. And lastly, we understood that the detection is a function of the phase velocity. And a few points for perspective, and these are only a few points, there are many, many more. Using the resonance inside uh, Metony Basin, we can actually image the underwater structure, the underground structure of this basin. And using everything I presented here, we can reliably perform source parameter uh, inversion and determine source parameters for earthquakes using dust records. And here we have to ask ourselves what is the required signal to noise. And we think that the answer will be um, the signal to noise required for dust should be much lower than that required for broadband seismometers, owing to the distributed nature of their measurements. We're not measuring the wave field at one point in space as seismometers do. We measure it over a pretty long cable segment. And another thing is to explore the way that waves are scattering, explore the physics of these phenomena. So that's it. Thank you.